going on. So, it goes like this. So, it says this. If you assume that f of x is differentiable and 1 to 1. Now, wait a minute. What does that mean, 1 to 1 function? Chicken pains. What does it mean if a function is 1 to 1? It means it's monogamous, Mr. Groom. That's correct. That means each x has one y and each y has one x, which means it has an inverse that is a function, and it means it would pass the horizontal line test, yes? Nice. Good job, man. You got a kid. Now, further, it says it is differentiable, which means its derivative exists, yes? So, no points? Also, no places where the function does this. Oh my gosh, it's one to one, but like instantaneously it's vertical right there. Ooh, sorry, this function doesn't count, friends. Can't be like that. So if it's one to one, Mr. Green, would this one count? Ooh, sorry, that's not one to one. No. Mm -mm. So it would have to be something that looks maybe something like this. Yes, one to one, and its derivative exists everywhere. Oh, that's cute. All right, let's see what it says. Is it if that's true, with the in, okay, this is important, it's one to one with the inverse is g of x is equal to f prime, um, not f prime, what am I at? What's my head at? It's f inverse, okay? That's what I wanted to say. Nice. Okay. If b belongs to the domain of g of x. Now let's stop for a moment. If f is the original function, yes? Its domains are the x's and its range are the y's, yes? True. But g's, who is g's domain? g's domain are the original y values, yes? Because they're inverses, yes? So in other words, b is a, b is a y value from the original function, yes? Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, well, you'll stick with me. We'll get there, I promise. All right, now, all right, and, and f prime of g of b does not equal zero. That's kind of a big deal. Then, g prime of b is equal to one over f prime of g of b. What? I don't understand. You will in a minute. Just relax. I got you. Okay. This thing here is looks gross. It's not gross at all. It's not gross. It actually makes a lot of sense. Hannah, if you recall back in the day when you were Algebra 1, probably like fourth grade or something, who knows, slope was defined to be rise over run, yes? Yes. <coughs> Now, if you were to take an inverse function of whatever it was you did the thing of, and the x's and y's flip-flopped, wouldn't the slope of that be upside down? Huh? You with me on that? Huh? And so, what we're saying here is this. We're going to have to pay attention to a few things. First of all, what is g of b going to give me? g of b is going to give me an original x volume. Yes? Yes? Because if you do f inverse, right, or g of a y value, it will spit out an original x value. Yes? Nice. And what do we know? f prime of an x value is a slope, isn't it? I feel like it is. So then the derivative of the inverse should be the reciprocal of that. I got it. No, I need to work out. I need to get some exercise. I'm too fast. Okay, hey, what's up? Patterson wanted me to waste your time. So, do you want? No, it's got product codes. No, you want them? No, that's why I was going to throw them. Patterson just said I should put them in your mailbox. Figured I'd skip, <laughs> skip the mail lines. Have the kids showed up down there yet? Yeah, they're working. Thanks, man. Yep. Not my nose. <laughs> All right, that makes sense, sort of, kind of. Okay, so let's pick one. So let's think of a function that is one to one. Square root of x. Good job. That's cool. I like that. 
Now, Mr. Groom, it's not, it's not differentiable everywhere because it's not differentiable at zero. Guess what? We ain't going to do it at zero. Let's pick a point that we like. How about two? Or how about, I'm sorry, how about four, two? That work for you? That works, right? X equals four, square root of four is two. Nice. All right. Okay. First of all, what would the inverse of this function look like, friends? I feel like the inverse, let me change pens. Sometimes I really like coming to a class where they pay attention and it's just kind of exciting. It just really is. Wouldn't it look something like that, friends? I feel like it would. And I, and I feel like the slope of this fellow, you see, the slope of this fellow is going to be the reciprocal of the slope of, like, say, at this fellow here. But we're going to work this thing out in a jiffy, and you'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm so amazed. Okay? Now, so this is my original function, yes? Yes, that's my original. This is, if you will, f of x. Now, what would g of x be? Well, technically speaking, it would be x squared, right? x bigger than or equal to 0, yes? Because it's just the one half of the function. What else? What else? What else? Now, it says, it says, by George, we should pick a b value, a b value in the domain of the inverse. Wait a minute. But remember, this fella is the original. Original. Right? That means that the inverse would have the point 2 comma 4 is on the inverse. True? Right? You just flip-flop them. Okay. So, it is 2 that we are interested in, yes? That's, by George, what we're interested in. That make sense? Now, the recipe says, and I quote, it says you need to do 1 over f prime of g of b. Okay? And what are we going to get? This will be g prime of b. Now, what I'm saying here is this. I want to have g prime at 2, which is another way of saying the derivative of the inverse at x equals at, at, at two, yes, right? At x equals two. Right. We clear? We're clear on that? Yes? No? Maybe so. Speak now, or forever. Hold your peace. I'm just saying. I don't know. Okay. 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 Now it says we need to take g, which is this fella here, of what? Of two. So let's do that. G of 2 is what? Well, it's 4, Mr. Groom. I heartily concur. Good for you. So this is the same thing. So what we're going to try to do is we're trying to find this guy right here. So this business right here is going to go into F prime. Well, we haven't found F prime yet. We should find F prime first. What would F prime of X be? Well, F of X is X to the 1 half power. True? So F prime would be 1 half X to the minus a half. Right? Right. So what would happen if I stuck, oops, foe into this fellow? Well, this would be 2 times 4 is 8. You get 1 eighth. Correct? No? Am I wrong? Where? On the outside. Oh, fart. And then it should be a quarter. Thank you. That's more better. Nice. That's awesome, Mr. Crew, but that's F prime. So I need to do, so I need to do G prime of two is one over a quarter, which is four. Wow, I wonder if that's true. Well, here's G of X. This is X squared. G prime, of course, is 2x. What would happen if you put 2? Uh, what would happen if you put 2 into there? Ah, oh, no way. I know. Now, we're not going to do a grand, grand bunch of these, Hannah Morris. The point of this is, dear, is to understand the relationship once again between inverse functions. 
yes? That is the X's and Y's flip-flop, yes? So if you have a tangent that looks like this on one of them, it's going to look like this on the other one. Because the X's and Y's are going to <gasps> flip-flop. That's kind of how it works. That's kind of the deal. Okay? Question. Wait, that feels like Y equals sine of X. But let me just say such that it's between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Right? So that looks like this. Hannah Morse, I'm going to pick on somebody else this time. I don't know why I said your name, just other than because I don't know. Lacey, I haven't talked to you in a couple of days. I feel like you've just been skipping my class or something because I haven't picked on you at all, and it's kind of sad. Lacey, this point right there. What's the slope right here, dear? I know, totally right. When you do the inverse function, when you do it, what's going to happen at those endpoints? Both these endpoints. You're going to get 1 over 0, which is going to be <gasps> undefined. But wait, there's more. This value here is negative pi over 2, comma, negative 1. Correct? This point over here is pi over 2, positive 1. This point is a goose egg, comma, a goose egg. If you were to play musical chairs, by the way, and perhaps it helps you, it helps me to draw in the line y equals x, it does something along these lines or whatever. Well, it doesn't go through there, stupid. <laughs> anyway, it goes along there. So sometimes it's more helpful, but what it happens is when you redraw these guys, it looks like this. What? <laughs> Look at that. Look at it. This thing is going vertical, isn't it? Right there, isn't it? Oh my gosh, it's like 1 over 0. I know. Hey, look at this one. It's also going vertical. It's like, oh, it's like 1 over 0. Weird. Weird. Hey, look at this slope right here. What? Look at this slope right here. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like they're, it's like they're reciprocals of each other. They are. Okay? That's kind of the whole point of that little blurb there is to show that. You're like, oh, weird. Duh. It's really a duh situation if you think about it because of course if you flip the x's and y's around then who used to be the rise is now the run and vice versa yes that's all it is people act like this is all it's not hard it's not hard okay now question for you this might be on the quiz we'll have maybe tomorrow no we just had a quiz i'm sorry next week freak me out don't freak me out i'm not in the mood by the way i gave a quiz second period today they're all crying there's like six questions. What are you crying about? Did you, you were there. It was ridiculous, wasn't it? And then one girl, I won't say her name. Can I stay later and work on it? There were six problems. I feel like I've had longer. You had an hour. It was only 50 minutes. I said, leave. I come up to the other room. I open the door. I come back to the commons, go to the bathroom. And like right as the bell is ringing, she's leaving my room. So she stayed and she's tardy to class. I'm going to tell the next teacher she has to mark her tardy. It's a joke. That is an absolute joke. Where's your homework? Well, I didn't do that. Anyway, so on the, uh, you know, test coming up, you know, quiz next week or something. And I want to take the derivative of this mess. Your first thought is, oh, dude, it's a chain rule. It is a chain rule. You're not wrong. But you're like, I can't remember how to do this one. Arc tangent, sure. Arc sine, mm, probs. But I can't remember this one. So listen, there's too much that goes on in your life to memorize all of this crap. So don't try it. Just always start off doing this thing. And then redo it and do this. So the secant of y is 3x, yes? Well, I need a triangle. Here's my triangle. Here's y. Here's y. <laughs> all right, the secant is 3x. So what sides do we know? Secant is who over who? Cho I don't even know what that means. That's what he said. But I don't even know. Yeah. Isn't the hypotenuse over adjacent? I feel like it is. Which means this side is 9x squared minus 1, right? Right? I feel like that's true. 
So I'm going to write this over here, secant of y equal 3x. All right, so what's the derivative of secant of y? The derivative of secant is secant tangent. You're not wrong, obviously. dy dx, yes? Equals 3. Well, that's cute. And so all a person needs to do is divide. What happens when you divide by secant? What do you get? It becomes 1 over secant, which is cosine. That's right. And what happens when you divide by tangent? It's, it's cotangent. That's right. So literally, all a person has to do is go look over here at this triangle. What's the cosine of this triangle? Look at this triangle. What is it? Look at it. Look at it. <coughs> Isn't it 1 over 3x? Isn't that the cosine? And what is the cotangent of this angle? It's 1 over square root of 9x squared minus 1. That's right. And then, Mr. Green, don't these cancel? It, they do. And you're left with 1 over x square root of 9x squared minus 1. Ta-da! And the crowd goes wild. Mr. Grimm, I looked it up in the back of the book. And I feel like I saw that this, well, I, I, I saw that the answer was 1 over this, I think, like that, dx, or something like that. Mr. Grimm, I, I feel like that's what it was in the back of the book. Laser pointer on the turntable, right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Recorded, right? On the slowest speed, yeah. Okay, you got them? They turn all right? Yeah, we got them. They <clears throat> and you think if you do it in tractor, you can be able to track it across there? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, man. <clears throat> but wait, I feel like, what's going on here? Well, I feel like here's the deal. If this is a, if it's a chain rule, right, right, then what I'm going to do is wherever there's an x, what am I going to do? I'm going to replace it with what? So if this is secant of 3x, wherever there was an x, I'm going to stick in an x, a 3x, yes? So it's going to be 1 over, it's going to do something like this, right? 3x squared minus 1, right? Times the derivative of this inside, which of course is 3. Oh my goodness, cancel, cancel. And you're going to get 1 over and it's going to be something like this absolute value business. You're like, why is it absolute value? And it's not that big a deal right now. Just, you know, go with it for right now. But we'll talk about that later. But there it is. Yay! Now, there is a reason for that. Um, if you look at secant, if you look at secant, arc secant rather, let's go look at the arc secant. Let's go ask the great Desmos. Oh, great and glorious Desmos. Look kindly on us today. There we go. And arc secant. Scream, I don't know what that looks like. What? Look at that guy. What kind of slopes does he have? Or she? I don't know. I'm just saying. What kind of slopes do they have? I feel like they're all positive. No matter what value of x, that is correct. That work? Oh, yeah. Is he going to be able to track it? Oh, yeah. Cause so you could like literally pop it up on a tracker and check it out right now? Yeah. Dude, thanks. Yeah. This is amazing. I want to see this. That's awesome. All right, so, Mr. Groom, Mr. Groom, I feel like when we did it over here in this deal, when you did it up here, you, you just waved your hands at this thing. Oh, well, I would have caught it when I went to look at the graph. Because at negative 2 or something, yes, what would this come out to be the slope? Well, this crap, of course, would be positive. But then you look at the graph and you're like, negative 2 right here, Mr. Groom, that would, oh boy, that's a negative slope. So obviously the thing had positive slopes always. The only thing that's going to change is this piece right here. That's why that has to be absolute value. This is where graphs really matter. Because if you didn't have a graph and you're like, it would say 19, what, 90? 1989, 90, 91. 
And you're dealing with this kind of a problem. You're like, well, I don't know. I guess I'm right. Maybe, sort of. Oh, you're wrong. Oh, well, how am I supposed to know? You, you're just supposed to memorize a bunch of crap. No. I got enough to do. I need to know how to do something. I need to know when I get done, does that make sense? Okay? That is the beautiful thing about a graph. Here, plus that thing and you're done. Oh, they're always positive slopes. I get the right numbers. Oh, well, they're always positive. I better throw an absolute value on it. That'll fix its wagon. Right. And you're like, hey, wait, wait, wait. What if Lacey did this? What if she, because that's who she is, you know, weird cow people, horse people. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. What if she put an absolute value around the whole thing? Would it hurt anything? No. No. Because you just be making them all positive. I'm just teasing. There it is. Okay? It would literally be just fixing it. Does that make sense? Okay, now. I'm going to pick on somebody else's time. Brooke, what if I wanted to take the derivative of... Brooke, this is important. It's kind of a big deal. You might want to pay attention. I'm just saying. I'm not judging. I'm just saying. We, now, we talked about what is the derivative of the natural log, Brooke, right? And what is it? Mm-hmm. Well, right. That's right. She's totally right, by the way. But here's my question. What if I want to take the derivative of the log base b of x? OMG, gosh. Any ideas how I might try that? Do you, Hawkins? I'll give you a hint. Oh, I'm sorry. Shut up. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll shut up. You go. Are you saying that we should maybe change the form of this thing and then maybe use implicit differentiation? That's what I'm talking about. That's right. So I would rewrite this as the log base b of x is equal to y. Yes? Now, that's b to the y is equal to x. Yes? Nice. Nice. Now you're like, Oh, that's, that's so weird. I mean, I feel like, how, am I, how can I get this y down from up there? I wish there was a function that when you did it, you could bring a, 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 an exponent down. I think there is. It's, it's take, use the power rule, right? Take the, so if I could take the log of both sides, specifically the natural log of both sides, I could rewrite this as y ln of b equals ln of x. Is that cool? Nice. Now, what is the derivative of this side? Oh, well, what's the ln of b? It's a constant, crackhead. So what's the derivative of something like 2y? It's just the constant, yes? So it's the constant, right? But whenever you take the derivative of y, you better have a dy dx. There you go. Equals 1 over x, yes? Nice. And so, dy dx then is what? What does it come out to be? <coughs> 1 over x times what? What is it? Times what? <coughs> 1 over the ln of b. That's right. That's right. That's it. That's it. That's it. I don't know what else to tell you about that. That's just, that literally as hard as it gets. So you could always take derivatives of those guys and be like, oh, well, yeah, that wasn't very hard. Um, sure, I guess, Mr. Groom, whatever. And, and, and on and on and on it goes. Now, what if, hypothetically, and we did one of these the other day, if we want to take the derivative of this fellow, well, it's a chain rule, it's a function and a function, yes? Right? Right? So what would the derivative be? It would be 1 over x, check it out, here's my x, dog. Right? Because it's f of g, right? So it's 1 over what's in the inside times the derivative of that inside function. That's it. It cannot get any easier than that, can it? And you're like, can I clean it up a little bit? Well, you can do this, I guess. You know what I'm saying? That's all you can do. Now, your book writes it like this, Bree, Brooke. Your book, write, your book, Brooke, writes it like this. If I want to have the ln of f of x, look what it does. It says it's 1 over f of x, yes? 
And what goes on top? F prime of x. That's it. So your book writes it that way. It's not necessary to memorize it that way. Yeah, it's f of g. That's all it is. We're doing f of g of x. That's all it is. It's just a, it's just a chain rule, right? So it's one of... What? We did. I'm just reviewing it for you. Just reviewing it for you. I'm just reviewing it for you. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about today, and it's very straightforward, hyperbolic cosines and hyperbolic sines. Now, I can never remember which one's which. I don't know why. Because I have Alzheimer's? No, I doubt it. Because if that's what the problem is, I should remember it. Hyperbolic sine is this function right here. 99% sure. I'm going to graph it just for fun, though. E to the x. It would be helpful maybe if you push the button. Stupid. E to the x minus e to the negative x. All in a parenthesis. Divided by 2. Yay. And then I'm going to go up here and go, hey, let's find hyperbolic sign right there. Boom. Oh my gosh, they're the same. That's right. They are the same. I got it right. Hyperbolic cosines is, is the same but different, obviously. Okay. Now, these get used in a variety of places. Mostly they show up in, to be honest with you, for most of us, they'll show up in your math text in crazy places where the book of the book gives them to you as the answer. And you're like, well, I got e to the negative 2t plus e to the negative 2t. And then it ended up with something like negative one quarter hyperbolic sign. You're like, I did it wrong. No, you didn't. The book does it just to piss you off. But they are actually used in some engineering things. They do pop up from time to time. It's not a big deal. Now here's the good news. What would happen if you took the derivative? What would happen if you took the derivative of the hyperbolic sign? Now, before we do this, Connor, what do you think it's going to be? The derivative of hyperbolic sign, what do you think it will be? I'm here in hyperbolic. Let's find out. So watch what happens. This 2 on the bottom is just a constant. Leave it alone, yes? So let's look at the numerator. What's the derivative of e to the x? I feel like it's e to the x. And what's the derivative of negative e to the x? Negative e to the x. Right? e to the negative x, yes? Which is positive, which is hyperbolic cosine. That's right. So you're right. Indeed, this is true. Did it work out good? Yeah. Think you can track it? Yeah, it's nice. okay. Can you send it to me? Yeah. We'll or paste it on my computer somehow or another? I will email it to you. Thanks, man. What if I, Hallie, wanted to know the derivative of hyperbolic cosine? What do you think it will be, Hallie? Do you think it will be hype, hyperbolic sine? I'll give you a hint. It's either sine or negative sine. Regular trig functions is negative sine. What do you think this one will be? Do you think it will be the same? I don't know. Let's find out. So, friends, what is the derivative of e to the x? Well, of course, it's still e to the x. Duh. Plus, you see, still plus right there. Now, what's the derivative of e to the negative x? I feel like it's negative e to the negative x. Shut up. That's the same as this fellow, isn't it? So the derivative is hyperbolic sine. Interesting. Interesting. Now, we're not going to do a ton with them. You have some problems on them. They're not very hard. Okay. Obviously, the, the, the rules for sine and for, for tangent are there in the book. Uh, what would hyperbolic tangent look like? Well, I feel like it would be this guy over this fellow. Because it would be who over who? Sine over cosine. But where'd the twos go? Well, they're both divided by two, so they divide it out, yes? Boom. Hyperbolic tangent. Okay? That's it. I kid you not, though. I don't know how many times you get a problem in a calculus class or differential equations class, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, hyperbolic tangent pops up. Hyperbolic sine, you're like, where did that show up? Where did that come from? And all they've done is they've collected it, put them together, called it that, 90% of the time just to make you mad. Okay? Now, on Thursday this week, 
we're going to discuss a little bit about related rates. We're going to do some interesting sort of problems. And then uh, Paul is coming on Friday and we're going to look at some videos with him. And I guess he's going to talk to us a little bit. And I don't really know. Now you will have a test next week on our long day. It's going to be awesome. Now before you start hating me, or hate me more, please remember that means you don't have to think of anything over break. So it's a... It's a pay me now or pay me later deal. By the way, all of life is pay me now or pay me later at some point. All right? So, you know, suck it up and do it now and coast over the break. Sure, that's probably the best idea because we get like 72 days off for Christmas. Ridiculous. Why, why on earth do we need to get out to Friday before when Christmas is ending until Sunday? Yeah. If you can answer me that one, you're overqualified to be in, in education, administration, and such. Lily Shriver, you need to go aspire. Oh, crap. I'll get it to you in a minute. I'm going to make an aeroplane. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know yet.